Hi everyone and welcome back to National 5 Biology Unit 3 Life on Earth. Today we're going to be finishing off Unit 3 by looking at Kyria 6, which is evolution of species, a part of the course that people sometimes find quite tricky because there is quite a lot of content to it. So let's get started. Now to start off with, we are going to be looking at something called mutations, something you may have heard of before. A mutation is the random change in an organism's genetic information. What's really important to know is that mutations are spontaneous, so we can't predict when and where they're going to happen, and that they are the only original source of new alleles in your genetic information. So although they are spontaneous, although we can't predict when and where they're going to occur, we can have a look at some different factors that increase mutation rates. So there are some different factors called mutagenic agents that can increase your chance of having mutation. And these are sorted into chemical and radiation. So chemical factors that can increase your mutation rates are mustard gas and cigarette smoke. And in terms of radiation, it's UV rays and X-rays. So we've all heard about the dangers of things like cigarette smoke and UV rays, you'll have heard beforehand about how you shouldn't be at uh, tanning beds, you shouldn't be out in the sun for too long without adequate protection. It's because these UV rays can increase your mutation rate, therefore that increases your likelihood of things like skin cancer. So now that we know things that can increase mutation rates, we want to look at the three different types of mutation that you can have. So the first one we're going to look at is advantageous mutations. So as the name suggests, some mutations give organisms an advantage over our individuals. Okay, these mutations just entirely by chance increase the ability of an organism or of a species to survive and reproduce. And that's why we call them advantageous. So for example, in these pictures here, you've got three pictures of different animals that have had mutations working their way through them and it's given them a, an advantage over others, usually in, the, in these cases in the form of camouflage. There are other mutations called neutral, where they are neither beneficial or detrimental to the ability of the organism to survive. Uh, these are just called neutral because they don't really do anything major to you. Okay, the example here, something to look at in the genetics part of the course, is your, your earlobes. You can either have free earlobes or you can have attached earlobes. Now that's a mutation, but really it, it doesn't matter. Your attached earlobes or free earlobes are not going to really affect your survival chances. And the third type is disadvantageous. So a disadvantageous mutation is quite simply where they disadvantage the survival of the organism. You're less likely to be surviving if you have a disadvantageous mutation. An example here is you would have your normal sort of donut shaped red blood cells, or if you have a sickle cell disease, your cells are shaped much differently. They can't gather uh, the same amount of oxygen. That's a disadvantage. That's not good for your survival chances. And again, just for your mutation. So once we've looked at mutations, we want to look at this thing called natural selection. So it's something you've probably heard of before. You'll certainly have heard of evolution and hopefully you've heard about Charles Darwin. Effectively, evolution is the, the change in the characteristics of an organism's DNA over time. Uh, through the changes in DNA to a population. And individuals that are best suited to an environment are more likely to survive. This is the idea of natural selection and known as survival of the fittest. It's really important that you realise that it's not about the biggest, strongest animal or organism survives. Sometimes they do. It's the individual or the organism that is best suited to an environment that will survive and pass on their genes. So let's have a look at how survival of the fittest works. So what will happen typically is that a species will grow, will produce loads of offspring and eventually get to a stage where the environment can no longer sustain that amount of them. In this example, we are going to be looking at rabbits. So imagine you have all these different rabbits that have been growing in a massive population. Now, as you can see from the picture and as you can see from looking at other people or other organisms of any form, individuals in a species will show variation. They will look differently and all this variation results from different mutations taking place. Now eventually what will happen is the environment will have these abiotic and biotic factors which act as something called selection pressures. Now this leads to natural selection taking place. So for example, you could have disease, you could have increased predation, 
there could be a change in the environment where, for example, in this picture of snow cover, where your your colour or your fur colour is now a bit of a disadvantage because you're standing out against the, the snow. And then what will happen is natural selection will take place. Individuals in the population that are not the best adapted will die off, whether it's by, it's by predation, whether it's by a change in the weather or a change in the environment. The individuals that are not the best adapted to that environment will die off. What will happen on the other side of that, though, is that the best adapted individuals in the population will survive. And they'll survive, they'll reproduce, and they'll pass on those favourable alleles, those favourable genes that gave them what we call a selective advantage. So basically what allowed them to survive, what gave them that advantage in their survival. And this is known as survival of the fittest. So the fittest in terms of the best adapted individual will survive. The best adapted organisms survive and pass on those genes that allowed them to survive. So for example, this brilliantly camouflaged rabbit uh, in this now snowy area will pass on the genes for a white coloured fur coat. And hopefully the offspring will have that and that can lead to a change in that population as well. So these alleles, these genes that have these advantageous uh, traits that we're looking for, that have a selective advantage, over time they will increase in frequency. So if we, say for example if this rabbit, if a white colour was quite a rare thing in that species at the start, after the snow cover comes in and these white coloured rabbits now have a selective advantage, they will pass on those genes and white coloured coats will become far more frequent within that population. That is the idea of natural selection. So in a very, very brief summary, natural selection is just the survival of organisms that are best suited to their environment. And this is the process that actually drives evolution, is what we're going to look at next. What we do with some things in classes is we look at some uh, case studies of different areas of natural selection. Uh, we've not got the, the things to give you just now, but I'll just go through some examples of them. So it's important to just remember that a selection pressure is what led to that change occurring in the population. And the mutant with the selective advantage is the fittest, the best suited organism that survived at the end of it. One story you'll hear quite a lot is this idea of the peppered moth. Uh, basically what this is, is there's a, a moth species called the peppered moth, where the sort of strange grey white colour of moth was the most frequent. And it was quite nicely uh, camouflaged against the similarly coloured birch trees uh, around the UK. There were some mutants that were produced though that were black, so you can see it just in this picture here. The black coloured mutant would get eaten very, very easily because it's not well camouflaged. You can spot that very easily on the picture at the bottom right of the screen, but you probably can't really see the normal coloured white moth. But what happened was there became a, a different selection pressure where when the Industrial Revolution took place in England, the trees became a lot darker because of all the soot that was produced by industry. And what then happened there was that the black coloured moth then had a selective advantage. And all of a sudden the pale coloured moth no longer had the advantage. That was now a disadvantage. So that selection pressure of predation by birds on the, the now pale coloured moths that are now standing out, that was a selection pressure. Having a dark colour was a selective advantage. So that led to the dark form of the moth having a selective advantage, surviving and passing on its traits and becoming uh, the more dominant and widespread form of the peppered moth. Similarly, we see things such as antibiotic resistance in bacteria. We use a lot of antibiotics to kill off bacteria, but we're now, because of the overuse of it, the selection pressure of using too many antibiotics or using them when we shouldn't have to, we now have some bacterial mutants that are resistant to antibiotics which are surviving and are now passing on their resistance to antibiotics to other bacteria. And this is what's causing a, a big issue, for example, with MRSA. And on a very similar note as well, uh, using insecticides. Hopefully you remember the use of pesticides from the start of Unit 3 to kill off any insects that are trying to eat all your plants. There are some, uh, again in this case moths, that are resistant to insecticide. If we use all this insecticide, that's a selection pressure on the population of moths. Those mutants that are resistant to insecticide 
they survive. They have a selective advantage, they survive, they reproduce, and we end up with more moths which are resistant to insecticide. So that's just some examples of natural selection in real life. Now finally, we're going to look at this process of speciation, the sort of main part of evolution. So speciation, if you think of the word species in it, is the formation of a new species, usually involved from multiple species being produced by an original species. So for example here, you can see that there was an ancestral finch, and through the process of natural selection and speciation, we ended up with several different forms of finch, different species of finch, and we're going to look at how that actually happens. The first stage of any speciation involved has to involve a population being split apart by a barrier. Now, these can either be geographical barriers, ecological barriers, or reproductive barriers. We tend to focus more on geographical barriers because they're a bit more obvious. That'd be a case of a mountain range forming uh, between a population or within a population or a river splitting a population into two. It, no matter um, how obvious this may be, it's just a barrier that has split one population into two subpopulations and then the process of speciation begins then. Also important to remember, evolution doesn't just happen overnight. Things like a mountain range appearing isn't just an overnight event, it doesn't just pop up. This takes place over a long, long period of time. It's not an instantaneous uh, idea that these rabbits, for example, now have evolution and are totally changed. So let's look at speciation. So if we look at these red dots and imagine they are individuals in a population, what will happen is in this case, a mountain ridge has formed between them. So this geographical barrier has formed and has split this population. And then what's happened is this population is now divided into two different subpopulations. We're going to call them A and B. What then begins to happen though is different mutations take place in each of the subpopulations, as they do with any population. However, these different subpopulations will be giving, being uh, exposed to different selective pressures. So for example, often when it's a mountain range, different sides of the mountain will have different climates, for example. So imagine subpopulation A is in a cold climate. So these new larger mutants, for example this yellow mutant, could have a selective advantage. It's, it's bigger, it's hairier, it's more likely to survive in a colder climate. And imagine subpopulation B, that that's a warmer climate. So these new smaller purple uh, individuals with these, these mutations, they now have an advantage. They have a selective advantage in being uh, more likely to sort of pass on their genes in a warmer environment. So natural selection will, will select for these different selective advantages within these selective pressures, and the individuals who are best suited to the environment will survive and they will reproduce. And eventually, over time, we end up with these subpopulations evolving, and they evolve so much and so much that they become so genetically different that we can now say that they are two different species. And even if the case that, for example, the mountain range disappeared and these two subpopulations were able to meet each other again, they would now no longer be able to interbreed as they are two different species. Remember back to our terminology on species, where if they interbreed but they cannot produce fertile offspring, they are now no longer of the same species. And this is what we can end up with, two different species from one original species. And that's it, that's unit three, and that is Kira 6, evolution of species. You need to know mutations, you need to know that they are spontaneous, they're only sourcing new alleles, and look at different factors, radiation and chemicals that increase the rate of mutation. You need to have a look at how natural selection takes place, you need to have a look at how speciation takes place. And once you know that, and once you maybe start putting these into notes or working them into an essay, you'll start to get the idea behind them. So hopefully these have been really useful for you folks. That is Unit 3 finished. I'm now going to get on with uh, finishing Unit 2 so we can have the full National 5 course ready to go. Uh, thanks so much for everyone for uh, subscribing to all of these and for following these from the start. Really hope these are working out for you and best of luck in the prelims that you've been doing. Thanks again.